So next up, we have Martin Strijek. He was head of technology at Explanea, one of the fastest growing companies in marketing automation and analytics field. He also led development teams at Piano Media, a world leading media paywall solution, and helped the company grow into one of the global leaders in online subscription monetization solutions. Currently, he is working as engineering manager towards improving disaster recovery capabilities, postmortems, and cost allocation of infrastructure at Kiwi.com. And with that, please welcome Martin Strijek. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I said, my name is Martin Strijek. Uh, I'm going to tell you something about the DevOps journey that we have uh, within Kiwicom. So only yesterday I realized that uh, some of you don't know even uh, what Kiwicom does. So we do combine flights uh, of, uh, of airlines that standardly you can't combine when you are trying to search for those flights. Uh, a bit more uh, about myself. So I said Piano Media, uh, one of the leaders of uh, uh, content monetization platforms. Uh, that system, a bit technically, was like a heavy loaded system because every page view that you did actually was hitting our system for authorization and authentication. And that means like you have constant load of, uh, of data stream being, being hit on your systems. Uh, at Exponia, uh, I love <coughs> loved working with the big data solutions, so uh, I was heavily working with uh, Hadoop, different kind of clusters, and, and that was something that puts uh, a lot of knowledge uh, to me. Uh, at Kiwicom, uh, I mainly work with platform team and DevOps team. Uh, my colleague Stano had a talk today about some of the, uh, some of the things that we do within the platform team. And what I love, well, those systems that are heavy loaded, I like optimization things and uh, good beer, whiskey, uh, and great food. So, Kiwicom, uh, where we are now. The company was founded in 2012. Uh, it was founded by two guys that uh, had little knowledge about the field that were, where they were heading. Uh, heading. Uh, then the crew grew a bit. Uh, there were five people mostly using MySQL and Python for the real-time combinations and uh, responses for the, f for the flights. Uh, in 2014, uh, there was a big change, and you, as you can see on this timeline, there was like multiple databases being, being tested uh, and changed because of the use cases. Uh, so we did try Postgres and the Redshift. Basically, Redshift uh, told us about like, okay, you're gonna pay a lot of money at uh, Amazon, right? Uh, we used also Elasticsearch, and we automated a lot of things around 2015 uh, via Ansible, uh, because the number of servers was growing heavily. So it was like from tens at the beginning to hundreds uh, later. Uh, in 2016, there was a decision being made that uh, there is no database that can actually do what we need to do. So that's the point when we, when we actually started developing our own uh, database that is written in C++. It's called SkyStore. And from the perspective of DevOps, that meant like managing that cluster of our own database and putting a lot of, uh, lot of uh, work into automating the infrastructure because uh, of usage of Amazon and GCP. Uh, where we are now, uh, we are around 250 engineers in the company. Uh, that means like a significant uh, work power that, that actually can deliver a lot of things. So about the DevOps. Uh, the problem, where it lies. So it's not uh, the server is your code. Basically, the two worlds collide at the point and, and you have the development part and basically you have the operation part. That's why like, uh, the DevOps was created at all. Uh, developers have to like deliver a lot of features always, right? You, you know all that, right? Uh, every day there is a request, change request, uh, issue, closed, opened, and everything around. Uh, everybody loves to start from scratch, right? And the most common problem is, yeah, it works on my machine. Uh, from the operation perspective, uh, you have to deliver a stable system 
uh, a system that can really boost the, the business and 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 like uh, provide uh, the capabilities for competing SLAs and everything around. Uh, usually, uh, the operations teams uh, have some on-calls. They hate to being wake up on the night, or they do 24/7 uh, shifts, right? And combining to that, like you have those upgrades that are necessary, and and this kind of work that actually provides the system and upgrades security reason for security reasons and everything around. And when you ask somebody from usually from DevOps, you usually get a get a response that I hate doing repetitive tasks and operations, so that's why everybody wants to automate themselves from out of the job, right? So how you can solve it, right? So you put everybody on call. And that means like Either you put only the DevOps guys on the call, and then they're gonna po be pointing the fingers to the developers that like, okay, I can't do anything about it. And uh, other way around, like developers have a con call, and they say like, we can't do anything because it doesn't scale from the DevOps perspective. So the problems on the on calls and others problems. You have two worlds, uh, the developers and the DevOps team, and basically, they, they collide at some points because you, you, you distinguish them and you put the alerts on one team or the other, but they need to actually work together because otherwise they can't fix everything that is uh, being in production, right? Uh, the common problems is like developers figure out that yeah, the, the system end up in a state that they sh never should be. Uh, <laughs> that's like a common thing. And from the devil's perspective, like it doesn't scale, it, it ate all my memory and everything around, right? So if I put one guy in, a, in the driving seat, so that means like if I put the developers into the driver's seat uh, of, the, of the system, uh, he's gonna change databases every second day. Uh, he's gonna put a lot of pressure on the, on the operations things because, yeah, today I'm using Postgres, tomorrow I'm gonna be using MySQL. Please give me this cluster. I need a resilient that, that, that service. I need this load balancer and everything around. And tomorrow he's coming to go, uh, go to you and say, like, uh, yeah, please give me 50 another service. Uh, and common problem, like upgrading, right? Uh, if I put the sysadmin in the driver's seat, then he's gonna say like, yeah, I need every infrastructure as a code, I need to be slow because I need to really test, I have to have a second second staging environment for the whole infrastructure, uh, please don't install anything on my servers, uh, and you actually end up in a state that, that doesn't help anybody. But actually both of the teams are there to help the business, right? To enable the business, so it, it, it doesn't mean that you have operations only because you need to, and that's like a uh, necessity, but you actually have that because it enables your business to grow and to provide the service at the level that your clients need. So what we encountered at Kiwi? Uh, we have been using several providers, so we have a hybrid model. We are using uh, either cloud, so that means like AWS, GCP, and bare metal. And with that said, uh, first thing that comes to everybody's mind is like, okay, networking issues, right? Because you don't have a cable from AWS or GCP to your data center, and you see all those problems within connectivity, uh, dropped packets, and, and everything around, right? So why we have decided this model? Uh, actually, it was because our API is heavily tested, right? And, and, and we, we have those spikes about a lot of searches being done, and, and we needed the capability of cloud to scale the API endpoints and the application that is running there. The problem was that, that the connectivity to our database was really like you have, we have 80 million searches a day. Uh, that means like you have heavy traffic every second, and that means like you have to open a lot of connections to, to our database. That means like you have these issues about the connectivity, then something is, is slowing down and everything. You need to, you need to do a lot of com, uh, compression because otherwise you're gonna pay a shitload of money for AVS outgoing traffic. Uh, the problem that is, it has, like the magnitude when you use more providers uh, really grows. That means like 
you end up, one provider is going to have a problem or upgrade and you have to migrate some things there and there because there is an announcement and this complexity about the operation task really increases. And basically, at the beginning, before, before we use like uh, uh, Ansible and Terraform, uh, there was like uh, mtmux for the rescue or multiputty that actually was doing like, okay, we need 50 servers, so let's, them, let's install them manually all at once. Uh, what we encountered on, in terms of monitoring, uh, basically we had Itzinga, but it didn't work well because of the issues uh, towards, towards the scalability in, in clouds, right? Registration, auto-registration, and the commissioning of, of host within uh, Itzinga and combining with that with uh, AWS was not working well for us. Uh, and basically we had to run a critical system for ourselves and that was like okay how are you gonna solve that and still we have been this we have been putting it aside from the developers right so so at the end we have a, we had done the decision to combine everything like application metrics uh, system metrics to to one one system we are using datadoc we are really happy customer of them we have around 1000 registered node uh, as we speaking maybe less uh, maybe more that means like really the, 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 capa the capabilities that it brings when you put uh, system metrics and application metrics together. That's like benefit that you can't really compete. Uh, on each of those nodes, we run several, several tens of containers. Uh, on the bare metal side, we also use containers. Uh, everything is being managed by Rancher. Uh, the, the point is that for some systems, we are not using any virtualization at all. Uh, in terms of databases, right? So, if you are in the seat of the of the of the developer, and today you decide for using uh, Postgres, right? And that was like the decision um, uh, at the beginning. Um, and you figure out like, from the operation perspective, it's really hard to manage a big Postgres cluster because of the sharding capacity capabilities of Postgres itself, replication, everything. So you just emulate the cap the capabilities in a way that you just divide your data through many servers and you, don't, you just don't care. You don't have a cluster, you have like 20 or 63 servers, each holds a portion of the data, but there is a problem. You have, to co you have to know where the data is, right? Because Postgres is not solving that for you because you have 63 different nodes. And you have to develop a master that is gonna know all those things. The problem with that master is that, yeah, you have one master, so either you go with a multi-master or then you have a problem because you have a spoof, right? Uh, we figured out that it didn't work well and it didn't, didn't scale with the, with, the, with the data that we were expecting to grow, to, to where we, we, we will be growing, right? So we decided to use Cassandra. Right now we have a proof of concept on Scylla, that's a port on, to C++ of, of Cassandra. And we have a cluster around 100 nodes with the replication, and that's the data that we have there, right? So it's around 150K writes uh, and a lot of reads. That means like we put those SSD drives really uh, under pressure, and every, every time we just see a spike, we need to add more servers because we can't handle not the network, but the EO on the hardware. Uh, the business side of that is like we exchange 60% of the data uh, every day. That's like you just delete everything from the cluster, several terabytes, and you just replace it with different, different data because the flights changes all the time, either prices or itineraries and everything around. Regarding the security, what have we been working with uh, at DevOps, right? Uh, so we have exchanged CDN provider already three times. We were happy with the one, first one, uh, but it didn't scale with us. Uh, we ended up using Akamai for a while. Uh, we are happy to be gone from that. Uh, uh, because the customer support is just not sufficient for the company as we are and, and at the scale, we, how fast we grow. Uh, firewall providing, right? Uh, that's like security measures. Uh, you either do it yourself. You you can you can use uh, your, like a private network for that, but we don't. We don't have a private network. We do use the 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 in Google Cloud or AVS the the, the networking that, that is there. But for the bare metal, we don't care. 
for some of the systems. Why? Because we just don't we don't want to manage another another problematic part for our systems. Uh, so DevOps or the SRE. The I, I didn't know first how to name this slide, and I said like, okay, this is a 40, 24 seven change that we are we are we are doing right. The company is still in a in a really uh, fast grow, and we are adding more data um, every day, and that means like we had to change some some things that we how we are doing things, and basically that's why we also created the platform team, and that's engineers that help internally for other engineering teams and create tools for for themselves and and for the engineering like for for example auditing and basically you you maybe saw the talk from uh, from Stano so uh SRE versus devops uh this could be like a book written on those to on those topics right because both are just enabling the business and and helping like guide guide giving you guidance how you can do the operation stuff uh within your systems it's not there doesn't exist a silver bullet how you yeah, how you should do that. Uh, I don't think that the SRE model, uh, SRE model uh, from Google is applicable for every company within every single point. And that's basically what they are saying. Pick only those things that you can do. Otherwise, you end up in a, within a mess, right? Uh, DevOps, from the DevOps perspective, uh, yeah, there was like a development and operations and, and you were like doing always this, this ping pong, right? And that's how the DevOps manifesto was born. Uh, you try to combine the development and and uh, and uh, engineering, and the SRE. Well, they try. How, how I perceive it, right? There is many options how you can you uh, how you can describe it, but SRE model basically uh, they can fix those problems if they see them within production. And that's what we are trying to, to, to do within our team. The platform team is identifying and seeing the problems within different, different applications of different teams. And they can, like, yeah, we have all the repositories open. So if you see a problem, a bug, or something like that, you can do a pull request to that repository and fix something. And that's basically where we, where we want to go. Uh, what we want to adapt from the whole book of SRE from Google, basically, Always you have this problem about operations. If you don't put a strict rule for that, you are doomed to fail because you're gonna be always overrun with the operations that's that's heading towards your teams. And it doesn't matter whether it is DevOps or it is uh, platform engineering or any engineering ten team that is handling some application within production. Uh, this year we have a goal from our CTO uh, Josef Kepeshi to. Yeah, there is an error in the slide. Uh, <laughs> to follow the Sun model. Uh, follow the Sun model, we basically want to run another team somewhere else in the Earth and just having like the, the possibility people not working during the night. That's like the main goal because nobody likes that, right? Uh, on call is the right way. Uh, that means like we have right now people being on call also from the development teams. And why I said the right way? Because this puts a lot of pressure on, the, the, on those developers, right? During the night, he ha he's being woken up if there is a problem. That means the next day he's not gonna be that productive. And you want to avoid that. You have two possibilities how to do that. You either fix all those issues, but then you just like close the business or something, like uh, you don't develop that. any new features because you want to fix every problem that you have, or any technical debt that you encountered, or you just distribute uh, the levels between different teams. So that's basically how the SRE model describes it from Google. Like, put those guys on call always because they're gonna know how the system performs uh, in production. Uh, avoid toll. I really like that word and the definition because basically people are people have tendency to automate things. But why are you automating things? Like. Are you automating it just for the sake of automation, or are you trying to solve any problems? And that's basically the, the, this definition, like manual, repetitive, automatable, tactical, devoid, etc., etc. You pick at least two or three from that, and then you should do something about it. Like, otherwise, you, you, you just repeat, repeat, repeat 
the same work or or uh, some operations task or some development and everything. And like this, this, this is really crucial for that. Like we definitely want to automate ourselves out of our jobs. That's like the dream, the, the dream come true, right? Uh, what we already do, we do blameless postmortems. Postmortems. That's like the best, best thing that you you actually can do with and, and start doing it. If you are not doing any postmortems right now, just like write postmortem for an issue that you had like la last week and start doing it. This is like best best thing how you can improve the system, how you gonna uh how you gonna like teach yourself about the errors that you did and and get like uh, improvements within your system. And that basically helps you to learn from from failures. Uh, and and we want to avoid them. And basically what we want to do is like create also a system that we're gonna use internally for better uh, runbooks creation, for example. Uh, some, some things can be done by runbooks, but some can't. So you're gonna, you're gonna have the possibility to create automation in that. The follow us, the Sun model that I already mentioned. Um, so launching another, another location somewhere else and automation. Like, I had a really good discussion yesterday about the SRE within Google, and, and basically we, we had a discussion about the automation and whether you can uh, automate recovery from a problem. And I said, like, you, within some companies, you can avoid that because you don't put production, into production problems, but in some companies you can't. And, and basically, sometimes it is good to automate recovery for some errors that you encounter. For example, a uh, server goes down or whatever, and you just issue a manual reset uh, to the infrastructure guys within your provider. They go there and restart the, the machine, right? Because it went down. And this can be automated. Uh, or a disk failure, right? You just automate the notice, and you just send them the automation, like, OK, please replace this disk because it's broken. Or application, right? So basically, basically, uh, what Google and Amazon is helping me with, with the auto-scaling uh, capabilities and everything. You just have something running one minute, and the second minute you don't have it running. So you don't know whether and why it was killed. You can have that as a spot instance, for example, in Amazon, and your application needs to be changed towards, towards that. If you don't change the application that way, you can't really create a distributed resilient system. Uh, how how is that gonna be possible? As I mentioned already, so we have we have two teams putting really hard effort towards towards like enabling the whole company of those 250 engineers towards having like a, a, the tools, the, plus, the the infrastructure and everything ready that they can really do only their job. That means create features. Uh, deliver them, put them into production. And they should not care about a lot of different things. We're going to do some guidelines about what metrics you should, for example, measure for applications that you go to production. And that's going to be like written as a code. And that means like when the application is going to be deployed, it's going to register to Datadog, and we see those metrics automatically and everything around. So, but if you don't don't dedicate people to this job. And that's basically what SRE means, like dedicating people to writing code, fixing problems, and doing the operation. If you don't do that and you just say like, okay, we have DevOps for that, it just, at some scale, is not gonna work. You, you're gonna have those problems about the big, growing companies. And Kiwi is one of the uh, fastest growing uh, within the travel industry. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to answer your questions right now. So we only have time for a couple of questions, but uh, let's start with the first one. Do you use Cassandra on bare metal or in AWS GSP? So we have it deployed in bare metal, but right now we are running a proof of concept uh, within GCP. Uh, that means like, uh, what is the limitation of the hardware there that actually GCP is providing, and uh, what, they, what is going to be the scale for what we need to if we just lift and shift the whole Cassandra cluster to GCP? 
You said you changed CDN providers three times. Which ones did you change and why? So we ended up with Cloudflare at the end. Uh, before that, we used Ak Akamai. Uh, Cloudflare, that was like uh, the best decision after long term. And we had been using Akamai before, but uh, that's like a huge corporate company with all those processes and really slow for us. So basically, if you want to onboard new page or new API endpoint to have it uh, behind uh, uh, WAF, that means like a long process, testing and everything, and we don't have time for that. Like, they are, they are too slow for us. And before that, uh, what was it, guys? Zanish, yeah, uh, pushed it by Oracle. <laughs> How do developers react when they are asked to be on call? Well, uh, the, they are on call, so they are not reacting at all to that because they already do it, right? <laughs> The point, the point is that, like, uh, it's not definitely, like, the, the way it should be. Like, you have to be on call, and then you should be working uh, the next day, the whole day, right? We are trying to, to, to find the best fit to that. Uh, and basically, the teams, like, the cooperation with platform and DevOps should, should really help us to, to move towards a better future for our engineers. So one last question before we adjourn. You mentioned a divide between developers and ops. What do you do at Kiwi to reduce that? Uh, can, can, please, can you repeat? Sure. Uh, you mentioned a divide between developers and ops teams. So what do you do at Kiwi in order to reduce that? Uh, well, um, the, 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 the whole concept, like, you don't put only the work on DevOps because you just can, but you actually uh, give them inf enough information about the system, how it's going to be designed, and let them actually work with you to work, for example, which services on AWS, uh, AWS you should be working with. Not only the developers have to decide, okay, I'm going to use Elastic Cache or, or that for, for these purposes, but you, you, you combine the knowledge because yeah, that's the whole thing. Like you combine the knowledge. That's the, that's the answer. So everyone uh, asked some great questions. We're out of time. So please come find Martin, and I'm sure he'll be happy to answer your questions.